hemos tenido ponentes que no han podido acudir, entre otros quien estaba previsto para esta mesa y por eso agradecemos todavía con más énfasis la presencia de Sol Transalay que, que bueno, pues va a hacerse cargo de, de esta ponencia, ¿no? una propuesta renovadora y cristiana para Europa. En estos momentos que son complicados, que son difíciles para toda Europa, que todos miramos a la Europa del Este, yo creo que es justo reconocer que a ciertos países de Europa del Este llevamos mirando los tiempos. ¿no? Y yo creo que nuestro invitado de hoy nos hablará de estas cuestiones. Soltán Salai es el director del Adeus Corvinus Collegium y justo antes de su intervención pues le he estado haciendo distintas preguntas sobre los proyectos que desarrolla Matías Corvinus. Muy interesantes eh, de, de promoción de principios, de valores, de, de lo que aquí hablamos con frecuencia de una formación integral y a eso se dedica. Y además... Me interesaba también bueno, pues saber algo más de él. Así que esto debe ser de formación profesional, porque siendo la directora del Instituto de la Familia, lo primero que le he preguntado era si estaba casado y tenía hijos. No porque sea un plus, pero sí porque se encuentran puntos de, de conexión. ¿no? Casado y con dos hijos. Y luego viendo su trayectoria, le preguntaba cómo de, de pegar el salto desde una formación, pues él se licencia en lengua y literatura alemana, sí, y ese es su campo originario, y de ahí pasa bueno, pues a la preocupación por la formación de líderes, por un desarrollo de eh, bueno, pues todo el talento de los que, no sé si en un futuro, desde luego no muy lejano, estarán muy presentes en el desarrollo de ese futuro y esa realidad de Europa, ¿no? Tengo que decirles que me dio una respuesta que me encantó. Me dijo, yo soy profesor y siendo profesor quiero transmitir más que un mero currículum académico, quiero transmitir todos esos principios y es lo que hacemos en Mateus Corvinus. ¿no? Cosa que es muy interesante. Cuando digo que eh, llevamos tiempo mirando Europa del Este, algunos países de Europa del Este, es porque, por lo menos por mi parte, con cierta envidia, vemos cómo se desarrollan políticas que son claramente favorecedoras de la familia, de la maternidad, de la natalidad. Las tres cosas, ¿eh? familia, natalidad, maternidad. Y esto es un empeño, yo creo que he decidido en los últimos años y creo que ellos han colaborado bueno, pues, eh, con distintas ideas, con aportes, con una trayectoria muy clara. ¿no? Eh, comenzaba nuestro presidente hablando de la necesidad de ir a las raíces, cosa que también repitió don Fidel haciéndose eco de las palabras del Papa. ¿no? Y Elio, cuando, cuando decía esta realidad de que y, y no hay iglesia sin sucesión apostólica, y tampoco la hay sin cristianos. En España, y no solo en España, pero antes y durante la pandemia, ahora todos se lo llevan crisis internas de distintas realidades y se lo lleva evidentemente la guerra, pero antes hablábamos de la España vaciada. Y me sorprendía enormemente ver cómo las medidas que se toman para esa España vaciada son de desarrollo de infraestructuras, de acceso a las nuevas tecnologías, de que llegue wifi. Y no hay medidas que sean, que estén dirigidas al fomento de la natalidad. Y yo no quiero wifi para que lo utilicen, pues no sé si habrá muchos ciervos, encinas, conejos, no lo sé. Pero si la tengo vaciada de personas, no me sirve de nada el desarrollo de medidas tecnológicas. Esas políticas de promoción de la familia que se están llevando a cabo en Hungría suponen que ahora en torno al 4% del Producto Interior Bruto se destina a proteger y promocionar la familia. 
con ayudas directas e indirectas, lo que ha provocado un descenso del número de abortos y un incremento de la natalidad. En una década, más del 24%, creo que es para quitarse el sombrero. Porque solo así, solo yendo a la raíz del problema, será como se pueda solucionar. Bueno, antes hablábamos del diagnóstico, no queremos solo diagnosticar, porque diagnosticar es el primer punto. A partir de ahí hay que aplicar el tratamiento. No, no nos sirve de nada un médico si diagnosticar y nos abandona. Queremos un tratamiento que suponga una solución. Bueno, yo creo que en Hungría están probando esos tratamientos que son novedosos o no, pero en el mundo actual sí que lo son, que son eficaces, que buscan ir a la raíz del problema y solucionarlo. Por eso, eh, y, y ya no voy a añadir nada más porque después de su intervención habrá algo de coloquio, por eso espero tanto de esta propuesta renovadora y cristiana para Europa, ¿no? esta intervención que nos va a dirigir el profesor Soltán Salay. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. Unfortunately, my Spanish is developing. I started to develop it today morning at the airport, so it's not in the shape that I could do my, my lecture in Spanish. So please apologize that, uh, that uh, I speak English. Next time I will try in Spanish, I, I, I'm sure. Um, my topic is, dear ladies and gentlemen, is uh, a Christian, Christian democratic proposal to Europe. Uh, but I would start uh, with a short disclaimer. We all know that uh, we are experiencing a rather turbulent time. This is not just a figure of speech. This is a new reality in an emerging era. I, I guess you already uh, uh, found out what I mean, the war in the Ukraine. We are now trying to navigate in uncharted waters as we are sensing the storm from uh, of a war which is raging in Hungary's neighboring state. As the Director General of Matthias Corvinus Collegium, which is the largest talent management institution in the Carpathian Basin, I have a very special duty in this regard in these days uh, because we have a regional center in Berexas, in Berechovo, in Western Ukraine, in Transcarpathia, where we teach young students. So it is our duty to help them and everybody else who is suffering now in the time of needs. I think this is regrettable development forces us to consider what we think uh, of our continent. Europe might have lost in importance in international politics, might have underperformed the top players' economic output. But at least we could say until one week ago, Europe is a continent of peace, security and prosperity. There have been armed conflicts in Europe in the last 75 years. However, it is unprecedented that a major power like Russia begins military operations in the old continent. This illusion has gone and unfortunately Europe does not have any means to change the course of history. We are not actors anymore, we are passively looking at developments, hoping them not to escalate. In the short term, we are hoping that the con conflict between Russia and the Ukraine will be settled peacefully. But in the long term, we need to find a way how to gain control once again over our destiny. Or else Europe, the cradle of Western civilization, cannot uh, escape its fate once the centrum becomes a periphery. In my lecture, I will attempt to find out when Europe got off the track and how the old continent could return to it. Dear ladies and gentlemen, sometimes I wonder was this, what distinguishes Western civilization from its other counterparts? What is the Western civilization's differentia specifica to be profoundly scientific? At the first place, you would of course say Christianity, and you would certainly be right. But I was wondering about more particular issues, uh, small quirks and features of Western thought that are not included into a system only characterize us. 
attitudes that remain permanent in different historical eras and which specify our views on the course of history. During this wandering, uh, it came to my mind, Western civilization has a special awareness of its own finality, their finality in time to be specific. Westerners seem to be always conscious of the fact that their civilization, their values, their way of living will be going one day or another uh, to an end. This is what we also feel now in the shadow of the raging war on our borders. But this sense finitiveness is a historical trait of European people. Other civilizations don't seem to have this feature or don't seem to take care of the specific historical perspective. China is by self-definition uh, the eternal heavenly kingdom. Buddhists by profession, by professing a reincarnation are less sensitive to passing of time. Maybe Muslims have a similar sense of temporal uh, finiteness, but as far as I know, they did not make it so explicit as Westerners did. One can find the roots of this phenomenon in the Western antiquity, for example, by Aristotle, claiming what is created will necessarily cease to exist. But Western awareness of temporal finiteness claims more than a simple logical conclusion formulated by Aristotle of the Greeks. On the one hand, our belief about the end of our civilization are more like a prophecy and comes fundamentally from Christianity. The apocalypse and the end of history, the second coming of Christ, when all secrets are to be revealed. These are all biblical notions. And the first Christians were convinced that will happen in their lifetime. And if you think about it, almost every generation of Western civilization was somehow convinced an end with a capital E, the doomsday with a capital D is near. Christian heretics of the medieval, medieval era, the great thinker Oswald Sprengler and today's climate activists all share belief that our short-term uh, decline is uh, inevitable. On the other hand, our apocalyptic expectations come from historical experiences. Only a few centuries passed since Christians of the antiquity formed their uh, prophecies of the end and their state, the vast empire of Rome indeed collapsed. We are speaking about the Roman Empire, which was the great, greatest civilizational achievement of its time. This uh, empire had a large army, extensive road network, integrated economy, robust political system. Everything that humanity can do to build a strong and perpetual state. And despite all efforts, it was gone or less than half a century later. No wonder Western men and women were shocked by this fact. So shocked that, that the echoes of this dismay travel through time and can be heard even today. There aren't any among the great nations of empires which Western civilization gave to the world, which were not afraid to have the same fate as Rome. Therefore, Western political communities were constantly in the search of their inner flows. Some thinkers, such as the British historian Edward Gibbon, thought the decline of Roman morals lead to the collapse of Roman Empire. So Gibbon projected his ideas to his present and was a frame of decline of the British morals and of the Anglosphere world. Others argued that Rome was too heavily dependent on military conquest and on expansion of the empire. So it becomes unsustainable as conquerable territories just disappeared. Similar arguments can be found among, among American isolationists today, comparing the contemporary United States to the once glorious but finally defeated Rome. And there are thinkers, such as already mentioned Oswald Sprengler, who claims the decline uh, is inevitable as a civilization becomes too old, rigid, advanced, and losing its connection to life and reality. The reason why I have shared with you all my contemplations, because more and more people are worried for the future of Western civilization, and especially for the future uh, of its cradle 
the old continent of Europe. The decline of West, of the West, the decline of Europe, the end of Europe, these are the sentences that concerns many of us. But unlike medieval heretics and doomsday heralds, we today have the tools of economic and social measure measurements to decide whether, whether we are fact in, the, in decline or our concerns are just business as usual Western anxiety. Unfortunately, the, formers, the former seems to be the case. Let me be briefly explain why I think it this way. There are signs of crisis in the European society, European economy and the way of life of ordinary European citizens. Even the EU is aware of this. Uh, if you check up the official homepage of the European uh, Union, I did this this morning, there is a page which labels every decade of the history of the integration of the European Union. For example, the 60s are labeled as the period of economic growth. The 90s I highlighted as Europe without frontiers. Positive labels everywhere. Except the last decade, can you guess how our 10 years, how our last 10 years are characterized? A challenging decade. Well, it was challenging indeed. And this typical EU bureaucrat euphemism. The situation is in fact, in my opinion, in way worse. Let's speak about uh, the social decline. According to a survey conducted by the CIA in 2018, the median age of the global population was 31 years old. Point blank, half of the world population is under 31, the other half of the population is over behalf uh, of 31 years. The European Union is very different. The median age of EU citizens was uh, 2018, 44 years. So 13 years higher than the world average. The highest value all around the globe uh, among all the continents. What about fertility rates? According to the data of the World Bank, the global fertility rate is 2.4, which is the half of that 70 years ago. In Europe, the same indicator barely reaches 1.5%. Demographic decline is strongly connected to the crisis of traditional families. Eurostat numbers tell us that since 1965, the number of marriages has halved in Europe. During the same period, the number of divorces doubled. So marriages halved, divorces doubled. Less marriage, more divorce, decline of the family. What else can you read out from these numbers? According to the European stats, the number of uh, extramarital children uh, is increasing. While, and this is the WHO data, there are 210 abortions to house 2,000 alive births, a very high number. Despite the alarming numbers, Western states and societies make minimal effort to support families and childcare. According to OECD, the European Union states spend only 2.3% of their GDP to family policies. Beyond social decline, there is an economic decline too. Eurozone is lagging in terms of economic growth. Since 1980, the EU countries grew 1.8% on a yearly basis, while developing regions and countries surpassed them with more than 4.3%. And if you look up OECD forecast, they predict the, fur the further declaration of the European economies. In light of all of this data, it is not a wonder that the EU sh EU's share in global GDP uh, halved since 1980. So within about 40 years from 26%, it went down to less than 15% of the global GDP. It's worth to mention that the European Commission expects this trend will continue. But the lack of growth is only a number, only an aspect of economic lagging. According to the World Economic Forum, labor productivity is also declining in comparison to Japan and the United States. Europe also lost, lost its ability to innovate. If you look up the World Bank statistics, you can see yourself. The average EU member state spent 2.2% of its GDP to research and development. The same indicator is 4.3% in Israel and 5% in South Korea. Therefore, it is not a surprise why the number of registered patterns in the world have doubled since 2002. 
the share of the EU among uh, of these decreased from 17% in 2010 to 11% in just 10 years uh, in 2020. Just a hint, 67% uh, of the newly registered spreaders come from Asia by now. So China and all the uh, Asian countries are taking over uh, creativity and, and uh, research and development. Europe is getting poorer as well. Despite the extended social care, the social inequalities in the European Union are growing. This undesirable process also began in the 80s. According to a survey by McKinsey, the US consulting firm, between 2003 and 2014, real income stagnated or declined in of 65 to 70 percent of European households. So a large number of European households uh, lost a lot of money. The next generation of Europeans is also in trouble. In December 2021, youth unemployment in the member states of the European Union averaged 15%, a very high number. Economic crisis leads to my final symptom of decline, the crisis of the European people and the way of life. Although Western states have the highest life expectancy in the world, several so-called civilization diseases have emerged in recent decades that could also predict more severe symptoms of social crisis. In 2016, 39% of men and 40% of women were considered overweight or obese uh, globally. On the European continent, the proportion is more than 60%. Obesity, in association with that, is also uh, growing and the highest uh, uh, in the European Union among all WHO countries. The number of people with diabetes in Europe has also risen from 5 to 7% in the last 15 years. In addition to that, uh, the suicide rates in the European Union have also reached record highs in the last decade. According to the WHO, four of the 20 countries of the world with the highest level of suicide are from Europe. Uh, Symptoms for social problems can include many addictions and addictive disorders. According to WHO, about 29% of Europeans have tried illegal drugs, and at least, um, and in some countries, just like in Italy and Greece, even up to 1% of the population may have regular serious drug problems. These symptoms of crisis are also being felt by Europeans as more and more people are facing problems every day. This is supported by several polls. Survey shows that more and more people are feeling that the European Union is basically going in the wrong direction and that the dark future awaits their children. It is telling that even according to Eurobarometer, the European Union's own polling company, in August 2021, around 37% of EU citizens saw European cooperation as a fundamentally going in the wrong direction, and only 24 saw it as a going in the right direction. So 13% uh, more uh, see EU, the European Union going to a wrong direction than the right direction. In addition, just over a half of the population thought that they would still have the European, that the, the European Union will not exist within 10 years, and only 27% said that the, they will, they think that within 10 uh, years the European Union will exist, and 19% are unsure. And at least the Hungarian think tank Sazadvik Foundation 2019 uh, published a survey of all in those days, 28 member states, and found that the most Europeans are highly skept skeptical about the future of their children. According to the survey, about 49% of Europeans believe that their children's living conditions will be worse than they are now. So half of the population in Europe, in the European Union, thinks that, it, that the children will live uh, in worse conditions. Looking at these numbers and facts, one must see the pattern here. Europe decline did not start today or yesterday. It began as early as the 80s. It began when the ideas of Christian democracy as the ideological ground of European integration was replaced by progressive neoliberalism. In what follows, I examine uh, what aspects of progressive liberalism 
cause uh, these symptoms of crisis. And I try to identify uh, what are these symptoms and uh, how they are connected to, the, to Europe. And I found, and I would describe for you six symptoms that I think describe the best the change between Christian democracy uh, towards uh, progressive liberalism. The first aspect is uh, liberal elites have been captive of an idea, the idea of secularized progress. According to the liberal elite, everything that happens in the direction of progress is a historical necessity. And the direction of progress is told by the current liberal elite. With this view of history, the idea of progress has been shattered by liberal democracy into a political product. As James Burnham, American philosopher and political theorist, wrote in his book, Suicide of the West, liberals use the concept of progress as a tool to make their own ideas and political program necessary uh, and unchangeable. The second aspect is, despite their efforts to seem to be the only political force, that progressive liberals usually fight with windmills instead of real problems. One of the dead ends of 21st century Western politicking is the so-called identity politics. Identity politics works like class struggle uh, during communism. Basically, they changed the class struggle to identity politics uh, in the last 20-25 years. Johann Goldberg, political commentator, describes the identity politics mechanism of action like this. It divides societies along different aspects until, in the end, society is made up of all atomized, distinct political communities because of what no clear majority can be made. There is no much democracy without majority. The political stability of truly democratic system is given by the fact that there is a strong consensus in a significant part of the society. We call it majority. As the concept of the majority has been constantly uh, saturated with, with negative connotations, just like the different, different uh, expectations and the different uh, uh, ideas of small minorities, um, these negative connotations uh, became uh, an overhead in the second part of the 20th century and the, the idea of democracy itself eroded. The third aspect is progressive liberals in the EU and in the Western world systematically worked on exiling Christian values from public life. You can talk about Christian values, you can talk about biblical values uh, in politics, because you have to, you have to separate politics uh, from secular values and, and, uh, and uh, um, ideas. They were doing so in the name of value neutrality of the state. As former US Secretary of State Kim Holmes described it, value uh, neutrality served as a tool against traditional Christian democratic parties, branded by the new political elite uh, for forcing the values of their own supporters to force society. With the liberal elite did just that under the goose of values neutrality. The phenomenon has led traditional parties uh, fearing political stigma to increasingly adopt the political and state theoretical model of liberal elites, gradually moving away from the intellectual foundation that once made them successful in their rhetoric and in both in directions. It is for the reason that the ideas of the goal in France or of Konrad Adenauer's legacy in Germany may now have become a burden. If you would now say ideas and sentences of uh, De Gaulle or Konrad Adenauer, you would be in trouble in the European Parliament. Today, the value of neutrality has become a political product that has allowed progressive liberals to pursue their ideas even against the will of their citizens, saying their decisions are, are free from prejudice and impartial, benefiting all voters. Let's have a total experiment. There are five uh, major countries in the European Union, France, Germany, Spain, Italy, and Poland. The first four has a progressive liberal government. Poland has a right-wing government. EU institutions now start infringement uh, procedures against Poland and Hungary for their Christian democratic approach 
and for protecting traditional values. Let's suppose that it is vice versa. France, Spain, Italy and Germany also had Christian democratic governments. Do you think that EU institutions uh, would start an infringement procedure against Sweden for their progressive policies? I think we all know the answer. EU institutions have been captive of progressive liberals and the people of Europe does not have the means to change the course. The fourth uh, aspect is progressive liberals have undermined civil society. According to historian Neil Ferguson from the 1960s onwards, as a result of equality processes, citizens of the Western states become more and more dependent of the state. In addition, the British researcher found that the number and importance of grassroots NGOs declined steadily in the 20th century, while new forms of communications and new forms of not grassroots NGOs, but uh, top-down NGOs uh, replaced them. And the traditional locally active communi communities lost uh, their importance. Ferguson sees this as a reason that previously autonomous people have virtually lost control of their own and their families' life, almost entirely handing over responsibility and thinking about their future to the state. The fifth aspect is the media space, probably the most visible. The media space has become dominated by progressive liberal ideas. As the po political elite shifted towards, towards the left and Christian democratist values were pushed into the background, the media space shifted to the left as well. This directly affects the formation of editorial principle related to political content. Uh, we all know how, and we all can see how much the media changed through the 68 revolutions in France, in Germany, and in other European countries, and how they took over the most important reductions uh, and the most important media housing in the Western world. And finally, the sixth aspect is the deficit of democracy. The lack of trust of modern democratic institutions is in Europe is strongly connected to the progressive liberal political agenda about their lack of political alternatives. According to Patrick Dinin, the Notre Dame professor, in a democracy dominated by progressive liberals, a model of governance has emerged that sees it as the task of elites to undermine the thinking and values of their citizens. In this top-down model of governance, it is up to the elites to accept with the electorate that the policies they set are the right ones. However, in a top-down democracy model, there is no possibility of correction, or if there is the extent of uh, it's very limited. You can see it, it's very similar, these developments to the NGOs, to the media, uh, and also to the deficit uh, of democracy. In the classical right-wing formations on a, a right-wing, left-wing formations on a Christian democratic basis, do not respond in time to begin Channel Waters' needs better. So the Christian democratic politicians and thinkers also forgot and also forgot to channel their, their thoughts and their uh, uh, ideas towards the, towards the uh, waters. Ladies and gentlemen, after reviewing the decline caused by progressive liberals in the following few minutes, let me uh, examine why Christian political thoughts are essential for a functioning democracy. The emergence of modern European democracies, as well as the creation of the European Union, would have been inconvincible without the underlying Christian roots. Modern Christian democracy is also due to these roots. Christian democracy is not outdated, not dust covered, uh, it has uh, to say for something for everybody. We can consider it much more as a complex system of political ideas. So a system of ideas that guarantees all the values to which Europe um, owes prosperity and stability. Christian democracy has proved a lifeguard for Europe in the tra tragic 20th century. Christian Democrat politicians played a lion's share in the construction of the post-World War Europe. Christian democracy is based on biblical tradition, so it cannot become outdated or radical. Its role in fighting communism, especially in Hungary, is very important, and national socialism tyranny, it's indisputable. 
and we can foresee it will be essential for the survival in the 21st century as well. The origins of Christian democracy are both Catholic and Protestant. The roots of Christian democratic thinking are to be found in social teaching of the Catholic Church, as well as in the social ethic of Protestants. The term Christian democracy itself was first used by the Catholic Bishop Lamourette in the French National Assembly in 1791. Most, uh, the most important theologians uh, and uh, theologians uh, of social ethics in the 19th century were German Protestants, such as Alexander von Oettingen, Adolf von, Adolf von Habach, and Ernst Deutsch. Catholic social ethics was fundamentally influenced by two papal encyclopedists, uh, Pope Leo XIII Rarum Novarum from 1891 and Pope Pius XI from 1931, Quadrismo Anno. The basis of this bundle of values is our common Judeo-Christian cultural and spiritual heritage. And Christian democracy is nothing more than translating this legacy, legacy into the realm of politics. politics. Thus, uh, a detailed explanation of this amazing rich intellectual heritage is far beyond the scope of my lecture. Moreover, probably even complete our lecture would be a little uh, for a complete review. What we can do instead is to have a look at what Christian democratic politics mean in an everyday use. The essence of Christian democracy is not being, uh, uh, it, it's not just that you are a church goer, an everyday church goer. It's good, but it's not a must uh, for a Christian democratic uh, uh, politics. Christian democracy's values uh, apply equality to citizens who not regularly practice their religions, but who values their Christ European Christian cultural roots. In most European countries, the latter now represented the majority and not the regular, regular practitioners of re religions. Among the Christian democratic values, the most important idea that determines public life is the principle of the common good. The common good on the other hand, can only prevail if members of society have not only rights, but also obligations. However, man created in the image of God cannot be reduced to an object and means of social and economic processes. For example, uh, certainly not in a way as Marxist thinking does regard the place of human beings in history and, history and society. According to the Christian democratic thinking, the principle of solidarity also plays a clear role in relationship between the individual and the community. Solidarity is rooted in the predeterminated interdependence of man and society, and belonging together also means moral uh, responsibility. The principle of authority is also fundamental. It's part of uh, Christian democratic uh, heritage. There is a need in society for authority to the, the direct members of society towards the realization of common good. Society needs people who obey the authority of the law and are devoted fans of free or freedom at the same time. And finally, there is a principle of subsidiarity. This protects individuals and smaller communities from accessing of larger social formations and thus limits their, uh, their autonomy. Subsidiarity has become one of the most important principles of the European Union as well. This is mainly due to the founding fathers, French politician Jacques Delors. In those times, it was even uh, Consensible that someone was both a committed Christian and a socialist as he was. Committed to subsidiarity was a confrontation with liberal individualism and left wing uh, centralization efforts as well. From the theological foundation, the basic values of Christian democracy, such as, such as the need of freedom, democratic rights, subsidiarity, social justice, can be, de can be de deduced. These would be the principles, but how does all uh, show up in concrete political decisions? So the most important, we have the heritage. Uh, from the heritage and from the history, we can see what are the values, but how can we make it to concrete political decisions?
The freedom of the individual is complete in family and community. The family is a natural community of life and of the parents with their children, and at the same time, a sole community that is the basis of human society. According to all traditions, such as that of Aristotle, who had a great influence on Christian thinkers, more complex social units emanate from the family. So, so the basement of all our society is the family. The family is based on marriage and the relationship between parents and children. However, the community of life and love is supposed cannot be built solely on personal attraction. It must be included in an institution in order to establish lasting relationship. This is called marriage. Its significance is questioned by today ideologies. Christian democratic politics, politics sees nations uh, as an ancient institution, as these political communities, as people uh, clinging in their traditions, fit into God's plan. Therefore, the strength of European civilization lies in the diversity of nations. So families are the basic backgrounds, the marriage as the institution that keeps uh, this together, and these uh, uh, traditions are building our nations. And the strength of the European civilization lies in the diversity of nations. And unification in diversity is the precondition for strengthening European sovereignty and preserving our cultural heritage. Work is the foundation of a meaningful life. Christian democratic policy considers a work-based work society to be desirable rather than aid, which also implies that promoting job creation is the priority of the state. However, in addition to a dynamic labor market, a good tax system is part of maintaining long-term competitiveness. It is a sex tax system in which the burden is constantly reduced uh, thus encouraging work and entrepreneurship. In an economic enterprise, persons associate with, with each other. The order of things should be tailored to the order of the persons, not to the way around. The modern system of work must rest on the primacy of man over capital, thus overcoming the condition between labor and capital. The purpose of the business is not solely to make profit. Entrepreneurship as a human community is at least as important uh, as uh, profit should be, or even more important. However, the definition that the economy uh, is uh, only subsistence is wrong. The economy must serve all spheres of human life. It is a condition of cultural prosperity that health, education, riches, and science also receive the appropriate material goods. Technological developments uh, uh, should be also co co considered. Many modern ideologies as secular religions have tried to systematically out Christianity from our life. The common determinator is that they promise to remedy social injustice. Referring to this, however, they try to dismantle the natural fabric of communities, traditions, social, inst social institutions, and as one of uh, the usual means of doing this uh, is, uh, is to create hatredness in the society. In this, the Jacobins, the communists, or just the now Marxist movements would be nearly similar. These so-called revolutionary ideologies start to confront men with God, women with men, black with white, social classes with each other. Politics based on Christian Democrat is also aware that our created world is imperfect and often unjust. This is a condition that cannot be eliminated by human force. However, it is also aware that it's duty to strive for the greatest possible common prosperity should be the goal. The continuously adaptation in the Western, uh, Western Europe after the Second World War, um, the fortunately was fundamentally influenced by Christian social ethics. One of the basic ideas uh, of the latter in that although 
private properly is a fundamental value to be protected is also associated with social responsibility. However, increasing secularization of European societies has posed a particularly difficult task for the Christian democratic parties, as well as the fact that the camp of supporters uh, of supranational centralization has expanded with great force in recent decades. The EU bureaucracy and certain interest groups with extremely large economic, political and media influence are trying uh, and interested in this centralization over the states. They are the ones who have re revived similar aspirations of totalitarian regimes. They are playing a dangerous game to destroy the independence of the nation, nation states. We all can see how this progress is going on in the European Union between an ever closer union or a, or a United States of Europe on the one side uh, and on the other side, a union of independent nation, nation states. Dear ladies and gentlemen, the title of my lectures is A Christian Democratic Proposal to Europe. Until this point, we revived why Europe is in crisis, how progressive liberals re replace Christian values with their hazy ideas, what the Christian Democrats' values are that once made the European cooperation successful, but these values are general political principle, principles they need to be translated to measures of public policy that would be indeed a proposal. In Hungary and the Hungarian government and the Hungarian public policies were heavily criticized in European media since the Christian Democratic Hungarian government came into power in 2010. To tell you the secret, we Hungarians were a little bit surprised by this increased interest. Why is Hungary so interesting in Europe? I mean, it is a relatively small Central European country, okay, with a unique culture and with a rich history, of course, but only with about 9.6 million people. Um, and uh, I think with this uh, performance, we cannot be a reason for an extended media coverage. Think about it. We are here in Spain, the sun is shining, the weather is fine. This is a much larger country with, a very, with also a very rich history and culture uh, and in a great, with a great influence on European and world politics better suited for being in the center of public interest. But somehow Hungary is more often uh, in the Western press. It was even more surprising when we Hungarians saw that not only criticism comes from international media politics, but there are more and more actors who share some sympathy for Hungarian politics. These actors do not want to criticize, but more like willing to understand. This was a phenomenon in Hungary that didn't exist for almost 500 years. So thank you for it. My answer to the question why Hungary is intriguing is simple. Hungary is the first country for decades which managed to translate Christian democratic values and principle to exact public policy measures of the 21st century. Let's see it, how it goes and how it was done. At the first place, Christian democratic principle become codified values of the political life. Hungary adopted its new constitution, the fundamental law, in 2011, and it came into force 2012. The new constitution was based on the idea of the thousand years old Hungarian state and, and, and uh, which reorganized uh, the nation maintaining strength of Christianity and protects the Hungarian language and, and culture. It defines a system of rights and obligation in which rights uh, entail responsibilities, human existence is, uh, is predicated on human dignity and in which individual freedom can be manifest only through personal responsibility and cooperation with others. The most important framework for coexistence are the family and the nation. Common welfare of Hungarians is the uh, attainment of a good life, order and security, as well as freedom. Within these parameters, the protection of identity has become one of the fundamental duties of the state, a good foundation on which to build. It is a truly Hungarian constitution fit to guide intellectuals like us through the noise and bustle of everyday life. These principles can all be translated into certain political measures.
By 2015, with the Christian Democrat foundations of Hungarian politics, I describe, has already been laid. That was the year when history once more put Hungary on the test. We found ourselves in the heart of the greatest civilizational challenge of the 21st century, modern migration, modern illegal migration. In the space of just a few months, a fence will build around the along the strength of, war of the Hungarian border, more than 200 kilometers long. In addition to this, physical barriers, uh, the border, a parliament voted to implement a multi-step legal barrier. The key institu institutions along the border were the so-called transit zones, which have since been dismantled under the pressure of the European Union. These defenses were completed just in time because by the end of 2015, almost 400,000 people from more than 100 countries were hoping to cross Hungary illegally and millions of people had reached Europe since the beginning of the crisis. The efforts against illegal migration was successful. The Hungarian border guards has stopped 120,000 illegal migrants only in 2021. But there are other eras of Christian democratic uh, public policy rather than defending our values. We must ensure that these values to flourish. That is the reason behind Hungarian government's decision to strengthen families. The family is an autonomous community established in human history before the emergence of law and the state and rests of the modern grounds. And we saw that we see as the basic of Christian democratic policy. The family is Hungary's most important national resource. As the basic unit of society, the family is the guarantee of the nation's survival and the natural environment for the development of human personality, which must be respected by the state. Growing up in a family, uh, it's scientifically uh, uh, tested, growing up in a family is safer than any other possibilities. The Hungarian family policy is based on five basic principles. The first one is that the decision of to raise children should be an advantage for the family, also financially, not, that, not just a disadvantage. Without any support, uh, if you compare a person, let's say 45 years old, with two children or three children, and without children, financially, uh, uh, the, the, the family who has two or three children is in a worse situation. The state should help that if you have two or three children, you should be uh, at the age of uh, 45 um, in the same financial conditions as if you have, haven't decided to raise children. The second one is that families must be helped with housing and more importantly, with housing that they own themselves. Thirdly, the family policy must be based on the mother. Fourthly, we must not only pursue a family policy, but must make the functioning of the entire country family friendly. And finally, the fifth pillar is that the institution of the family and children must be protected also by the means of law. Since 2010, Hungary spent three and a half times as much on family policy and will even further uh, increase uh, it to 6.2% of the GDP. You remember it was in an, in an average in the EU a bit more than 2%. Anyway, this makes Hungary uh, with this 6.2% an absolute champion in Europe. The Hungarian government introduced direct support accompanied by discounting credits to buy homes. So far, uh, 206,000 families has drawn on this support scheme, which amounts to 1.8 8 billion euros. Hungary as well uh, reintroduced um, the extensive uh, tax, rebate, uh, tax rebates uh, and for which 1 million families are entitled. So if you have children, uh, you have to pay less taxes. If you have more than field, uh, four children, you don't have to uh, pay personal income tax. The year the families get back the, their personal income tax pay 2021. Uh, so this year, everybody who is raising children received back all the uh, personal income tax that they paid 2021. They received it back at the beginning of 2022. It was again 1.5 billion euros uh, for the families. 
But did it yield any results? It is a question rightly asked and often asked in the European Union. Investing into family policies is indeed a risky business, but I can assure you we have some particular achievements. Compared to 2010, the number of marriages has doubled. The last year broke a, 20, uh, a 35 years old record as far the number of newlyweds are concerned. And today, far less children are being born outside of marriage. Um, far less children are being born outside of marriage than in a marriage. So in a marriage, a lot more kids are, are now born in a family and can raise in a family than in a, than in a, a one person family. This means that uh, in 2015, 48% of the children had born out of wedlock, which decreased to 30%. The ultimate measurements of success is fertility rate. At this point, uh, one could ask why I don't talk about the numbers of birth. My, my answer is simple. Hungary has as well a declining and aging population. So less people can now have children. Since 2010, the fertility rate has grown by 27%. Now stands at 1.6 compared to 1.6. Uh, 25. So it, it, it raised from 1.25% 2010, now 2021, 1.6%. Ladies and gentlemen, you may ask, these public policy measures would be a proposal for Europe or the European nation states. I have to say, not necessarily. Christian democracy is a flexible framework, and this is its advantage. What works for one nation may not to another. Every political community needs to find its own solutions to its problems. This is where Christian Democrat can help. The values are guidelines which designate policy goals, but the values can be realized by a wide set of tools proper to every political community. The Hungarian model is relevant because it's proved a successful political agenda can be set on based Christian Democrats values. It functions better than progressive liberal agenda, which only helped to push Europe into decline. The proposal is simple. Let us return to Christian democracy. Thank you for your attention.